today we are going to talk about the functional type of movements in gastrointestinal system basic movements or functional type of movement functional type of movements right in gastrointestinal system uh, the major movement in gastrointestinal system uh, they are divided into two part is it right uh, what are the two main types of the movement yes who will tell me what are the two main types of movement in gastrointestinal system there are only two types look number one there should be propulsive movement we should propel the food or the chyme forward look for the proper processing of the food what is required for proper processing of the food is number one you should be able to ingest it there's of no benefit on the plate right and after ingestion and swallowing when it goes into uh, what is the stomach and small gut and large gut what should happen there number one thing food should stay in different areas of gast gastrointestinal system for appropriate duration it should not understay or it should not overstay because different areas in the GIT process the food in a different way is that right so for this purpose number one there should be propulsive movement we should propel the what is this contents in the GIT forward from oral side to the anal side is that right we have to use the propulsive movement secondly on the way not only we need to propel the food we have to mix the contents of food with the gastrointestinal secretions so that secretions and contents of food get mixed so that secretions can work on the gastrointestinal food stuff and digest it right for that purpose we need to do mixing right so second type of the movement should be mixing so there are basically two type of movements there are propulsive movement propulsive movement and there are mixing movement is that right when we talk about the propulsive movement remember propulsive movement are an inherent feature of all those tubes in our body all those tubes in our body where smooth muscles are connected with each other through the gap junctions multiple smooth muscles are connected with each other through the gap junctions their propulsive movement can be produced for example not only gastrointestinal system even in ducts of the glands they also have propulsive movement then propulsive movement are also seen in ureters is that right now so this is propulsive movement is the inherent tendency of those tubes in our body which have smooth muscles in their wall and those smooth muscles are connected with each other with the gap junctions is that right when a lot of smooth muscles are connected with the gap junction what do we call this this type of smooth muscle unitary smooth muscle they act as a unit is that right there may be 10,000 smooth muscles but they are connected e with each other through the gap junctions so they are acting like a network or syncytium so we call them unitary smooth muscle now GIT has unitary smooth muscle and propulsive movements is a feature of unitary smooth muscles now what what is the purpose of propulsive movement in the gastrointestinal system it's very clear that they are moving the contents of the lumen right from one point to the next point usually from oral side to the anal side is that right now propulsive movements are also called peristalsis peristalsis classically we can explain peristalsis as right let me tell you suppose this is the gastrointestinal system right now what is basic concept of peristalsis peristalsis means that let's suppose there is a bolus here or there is accumulation of chyme here now what will happen this this need to be propelled in this direction to the anal side if it need to be propelled how the system start it's very simple number one this bolus right will distend the wall of gastrointestinal system and when it will distend the wall of gastrointestinal system that will produce 
activate the stretch receptors let me enlarge this part of gut this part of gut here right this part and now there are stretch reflex into this area when they are stretched when stretch stretch uh, neurons are stimulated they will stimulate the myenteric plexus as i told you in the previous video that myenteric plexus has two layer it has ascending neurons and yes and descending neurons and ascending neurons are stimulatory and descending neurons are yes inhibitory that's right now myenteric plexus can be stimulated number one by the stretch in the wall number two it can also be stimulated by special chemical substances like amino acids or like uh, fats or there are different substances within the food which can stimulate some chemoreceptors here in the mucosa so right in the same way if there's irritation to the mucosa that can also stimulate certain sensory neurons here so what happens that either stimulation is coming from mucosal irritation or mucosal stimulation by certain type of chemoreceptors or stimulation is coming from the stretch receptors right and this will stimulate the myenteric plexus now what really happens that when myenteric plexus is stimulated right then these neurons which are ascending pathway they release stimulatory neurotransmitters like acetylcholine and substance p and these neurons which are descending right they release inhibitory inhibitory neurotransmitters what are those vip vasoactive intestinal peptide and nitric oxide so it's very natural that just up in the part segment of the gastrointestinal system just on the oral side of the stimulus acetylcholine and substance p will be released and to the distal side let's take the oral side as proximal side and let's in my lecture we take uh, what is this inner side as distal side so proximal to the bolus stimulatory neurotransmitters are released by myenteric plexus and distal to the bolus inhibitory neurotransmitters like vip and nitric oxide are released what happens smooth muscle just proximal to the stimulus will constrict and produce a constriction ring but at the same time uh, muscles in the muscularis externa distal to the stimulus will get relaxed now it's very natural when you produce a constriction ring on the proximal side and relax the wall of the gut distal to the stimulus what will happen it will build the pressure there's more pressure on the on the contents of the lumen on the oral side and less pressure on the inner side so it will move forward when it will come to the new place let's suppose then it has shifted to this place now when it has gone to the new place now at this place at this new place stimulatory neurotransmitters will be released and just in front of that there will be inhibitory neurotransmitters will be released by which plexus myenteric plexus right so what will happen it will slip forward and then this process will repeat again and again so due to this mechanism we can say that a propulsive movement will be produced a movement which can propel the contents of the GIT uh, from oral side to the inner side this is clear right now another thing which is important that this ring when it once it develops how much it will move it depends on the general excitability of the gastrointestinal system at that very moment for example if there's strong parasympathetic stimulation right then this peristalsis will move for longer distance but if there is a, in extrinsic nerves like parasympathetic nerves right they are not stimulated and not st uh, stimulating the myenteric plexus enough then the peristalsis will move for smaller distance am i clear so even though this uh, movement peristalsis is produced within the, within the myenteric reflex but it will be a weak peristalsis a strong peristalsis it depends on many factors including the extrinsic neuronal control like parasympathetic or sympathetic stimulation here i want to know that everyone knows parasympathetic system stimulates the gastrointestinal activity what about sympathetic system that inhibits is that right that 
the sympathetic nervous system inhibits the gastrointestinal activities anyway so this is something about propulsive movement right this is how they are produced then a part of the GIT there is a constriction ring produced and that constriction ring move from oral side to the aboral side right uh, taking the content so luminal content pushing towards the inner side then there are other movements which are called mixing movement here I want to make it clear propulsive movement can do some degree of mixing also right of course when uh, contents of the lumen are pushed forward on the way some secretions are added and some mixing will be done right especially in the stomach so a weak propulsive movement do the mixing which I will explain later now mixing movement let us suppose right now this area is not undergoing propulsive movement rather it is busy in mixing is that right remember purpose of propulsive movement is different mixing purpose of mixing movement is different purpose of mixing movement was to mix the secretions of gastrointestinal system with the food content right so that there should be good digestion plus repeatedly uh, uh, mix the what is this con contents of the lumen and bring different part of the luminal content with the mucosal wall for better absorption is that right but purpose of propulsive movement is the food has been let's suppose processed in the stomach properly only then it should move to the duodenum right if it has been properly processed in the duodenum and duodenum and ileum only then it should go to the colon and so and so forth is that right now let me tell you in a very simple way that what can be the example of mixing movement mixing movement let me show you one mixing movement here let's suppose this is segment of GIT GI tract now what happens in mixing movement localized constriction ring develop at multiple places which do not move because if they start moving too much then they, that is peristalsis and that becomes propulsive but if multiple simultaneously multiple constriction ring appear for example smooth muscle here contract here contract here contract and here contract so what will happen that gastrointestinal system it will become like this here and again it will become so what is happening that contents of the lumen will be compressed at multiple places now here what I am showing that luminal content whatever are there now they are chopped down into multiple pieces right so multiple look circular smooth muscles constrict at multiple points simultaneously and luminal contents are divided into like chain of sausages right it remain just few seconds like this and then these points relax and some other points contract let's suppose all of them suddenly relax and now these points constrict if these points constrict now what will happen these are different points now which are constricting constriction point is here and what is happening this will become constricted here and again it is opened here and constricted here then here and here now you can understand what has happened that same let's suppose if this was the one area now due to new construction point which appeared in between the previous two points it chops it off to this side and this side so you got it now this point when their construction appear at this point this goes partly there and partly here if this is construction point appear here so and so forth so what is happening again in mixing movement when re when repeatedly multiple circular construction appear simultaneously within the GIT and divide the GIT into small segments then we call such movement in small intestine are called segmental movements right and these segmental movements special thing is that at different times these segmental 
कंस्ट्रक्शन अपियर साइमिल्टेनियसली बट एट डिफरेंट पॉइंट इन दिस वे दे चॉप द कॉन्टेंट्स ऑफ द ह्यूमन ऑफ द गैस्ट्रो इंटेस्टनल सिस्टम हेयर एंड देन देयर and repeatedly by this process they mix these contents of the lumen with the different secretions plus they bring different components of the food or luminal content in contact with the mucosa for absorption purpose so what are the basic two movements the propulsive movements classically peristalsis and the mixing movement like segmentation movement in small intestine is that right do you have any question now we come to the role of myenteric plexus in these movements in previous video we have discussed in detail but how myenteric plexus work but one thing is very important if due to any reason myenteric plexus is not functional what could be the reason myenteric plexus is not functional if it is absent congenital absence of myenteric plexus if in some segment of the gastrointestinal system myenteric plexus is absent Is the right? For example, neural neural crest cell did not migrate to that segment of the gastrointestinal system, and there the ganglia of the myenteric plexus are not there. You can say a ganglionic segment is there. Do you think that will produce mixing movement significantly, or uh, will produce some significant peristaltic movement? No. So it means myenteric plexus is important. Number two, if you give atropine to a person, and if uh, Higher dose of atropine is given. Atropine block which receptors? Muscarinic receptors for acetylcholine, right? And acetylcholine was one of the stimulatory neurotransmitters in gastrointestinal system. But if you give the person atropine, an atropine block most of the muscarinic receptors for acetylcholine, then acetylcholine failed to work on gastro. Now smooth muscle. Do you think you can get much mixing movements or you can get much? Uh, propulsive movement no so you have to remember it for git movement for significant or effective git gastrointestinal movement uh, i'm talking about from esophagus down up to anus we have to have what myenteric plexus is that right the next thing there is a very simple concept called the law of gut what is law of gut there is some high court there or supreme court law of gut Yes, what is law of gut? It's a very simple concept. I don't know why they try to make it a law. The thing is that our gastrointestinal system has myenteric plexus polarized in such a way or arranged in such a way that whenever you distend any part, or stimulate any part of gastrointestinal system, peristalsis, which is move uh, produced by the myenteric reflex, as I told you, that whenever there is stimulus or stretch, right? What what happens? Peristalsis. is produced if myenteric system is intact right so whenever you produce a stimulus in any point in the gastrointestinal system right if myenteric reflex is intact the peristalsis which will be produced will move more to anal side and it will die out to the oral side you are understanding thank god for this thing otherwise you know what may happen one day you forget you have to move the things in which direction yes so thank god it is not in your will it's automatically happening that nature has designed the myenteric plexus in such a way that whenever there is significant stimulus to myenteric plexus and peristalsis is generated it dies out on the oral side and it effectively moves the constriction ring effectively move towards the anal side this is called law of the gut that this is the law of the gut that when myenteric reflex is intact and stimulus for peristalsis is given peristalsis will more effectively move from oral side to the aboral side or anal side am i clear i told you this topic is very easy it should be banned to teach it now we have talked about uh, okay after this basic concept about the movement now let's start step by step what are the special movement related with the ingestion of food like mastication and swallowing what are the special movements in stomach what are the special movement of small intestine and then of course in the end what are the special movement in large intestine and then we will study what is defecation reflex is that right now one part by part we'll discuss 
the motility in the different part of the gastrointestinal system. Let's start with the very simple ingestion. Now we are going to discuss in this order. First we will talk about ingestion of food. The first part of ingestion is what? Chewing. Yes. Chewing. After that chewing then we are going to talk about yes swallowing and after that we are going to talk about motor functions of stomach motor functions of stomach now first of all chew, chewing everyone knows what is chewing that you put some eatable substance in your mouth and then you start chewing it grinding it cutting it right uh, our teeth are very appropriately designed you know the frontal teeth incisors are very good for cutting purpose and teeth in the back they are very good for grinding purpose is that right but this chewing this is reflex activity or voluntary activity it is both no it is both uh, chewing can be done voluntarily even sometimes you like to chew the things which are not edible with your own choice and you know with what pressure to apply and how much to apply is that right? Chewing can be voluntary. At the same time, you may put chewing gum in your mouth and you start moving your jaw and then you start doing some other work and you forget that you are moving your jaw. Then reflex, chewing reflex has taken its work. Secondly, thank God, reflex component is there because when you are eating, do you think with every uh, chewing step you are memorizing how, where to move the tongue and how to move the teeth, this is autom almost automatically occurring. So, chewing is voluntary as well as reflex activity. Thank God reflex activity is there. Sometimes we are doing some work and while we are chewing something, it is automatically going on. So, we should know about the chewing reflex. Who will tell me about chewing reflex? Yes, anyone? It is very simple. Look, look, let me tell you. Of course, when you put some, uh, let's suppose you have taken some piece of food in your mouth. Is that right? Okay, before the, I really go for chewing, what is the difference in hunger and appetite? Don't tell me the spelling difference. Hunger and appetite. Okay, let me tell you before he complicates the issue. Hunger is, hunger is, listen, listen. Hunger is intrinsic desire to take food, but appetite is your pre when you preferentially seek for a specific type of food. Is that right? If you say I have to eat KFC and I will miss all other things, that is appetite for KFC. Is that right? But hungry means you just want to eat, and what you want to eat and you want pref you are seeking a specific type of food, then you are having appetite. Is that right? So this anyway, so let's go back to the chewing. Chewing reflex, yes. It's very easy. You put something in your mouth, right? And then what, what happens? You press the food. Is that right? Pressure in oral cavity goes up. That inhibits the muscles of mastication. What are the muscles of mastication? Uh, muscles of mastication, uh, main muscles of mastication I will talk about, which are the muscles which uh, close the mouth temporalis masseter and medial pterygoids and which are the main muscles which open the mouth lateral pterygoids right okay I will, I will not go into detail how lateral pterygoid open the mouth but what really happens when you put something in your mouth after that uh, when you initially you voluntarily compress is that right in your oral cavity pressure goes up and then a receptors in oral cavity they give signal to the brain stem and that inhibits the muscles of mastication. When muscles of mastication are inhibited, jaw will drop. As soon as jaw drops, it elicits the stretch reflex. You know, as on the muscles you can produce stretch reflex. As the jaw drops, it stretches those muscles of masseter and temporalis and medial pterygoid. When that stretch reflex is elicited, muscles will contract. There is rebound contraction. When they will contract, you will chew. But as soon as pressure will go up in oral cavity, what happens? You again inhibit the muscles of mastication, again jaw drop. As soon as it drop, it again produces what? Stretch reflex. So this cycle is repeated again and again and you keep on chewing depending upon how long you want to do it. Is that right? So this was your chewing reflex. 
and once you have chewed the what is the advantages of chewing or mastication so yeah of course we break down the food particles i know you don't chew the water right you break down the food particles there are two three advantages one is very simple that you are mixing the saliva with that right during mastication saliva get mixed right and slavery enzymes can also amylase can start working on carbohydrate secondly uh, when saliva gets mixed the bolus gets lubricated is that right thirdly pieces of the food become very small now when the bolus become lubricated properly and food pieces become very small another advantage is then food will go down there is less chance of excoriation or damage to the mucosa if you take big bolus and without proper grinding and chewing you swallow you may damage your esophagus mucosa is that right thirdly when you are grinding the, uh, the food particles and making them smaller you are increasing the surface area and you know enzymes in our gastrointestinal system work on the surface of the food particles and if you are increasing the surface area uh, enzymatic digestion become accelerated am i clear so anyway you have done the chewing the next step is swallowing right to explain the swallowing i should make a diagram here uh, here you are I think your nose should be smaller or it's okay. Right. Okay. Now, oral cavity, there's tongue here. What is it here? Tonsil on that side. And 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 what is this? Pharynx. Here is what is here? larynx and what is this epiglottis and here is trachea right now the important point which you need to learn here is that especially in the pharynx this area which is this part of the pharynx work for respiratory passage as well as it can work for food passage so we have to be very careful at this stage that food should not go to the respiratory package it should go to the food passage now swallowing what is swallowing swallowing the process of taking the bolus of the food from posterior part of the oral cavity to the stomach is that right of course don't forget there is a stomach i think i made it too much okay now this is your esophagus now in the swallowing process how it starts you have done enough chewing and if you feel the food is ready for swallowing you will take the bolus backward where you will take it you will with the tongue you will push the food bolus backward and this is the early stage of the swallowing we also call it oral stage of swallowing there is oral stage of swallowing there is pharyngeal stage of swallowing and there is esophageal stage of swallowing this initial stage of swallowing is voluntary right in this what happens that voluntarily once you think that you have uh, chewed the food enough and food is bolus is ready to be swallowed what you do you move your tongue upward you move your tongue upward when you move your tongue upward what really happens you press the food bolus against the palate right and push it backward when it moves backward right on the opening of the oropharynx there are a lot of sensory receptors for the swallowing purpose right the mucosa here right what is this area hard palate at the top on the side there are tonsillar pillars and tonsillar mucosa and then lingual mucosa is that right now all this mucosa here is very very sensitive as soon as you take the tongue upward push the bolus backward and bolus come in touch with these this area and their sensory system that triggers the swallowing reflex so where the swallowing reflex is triggered when you move the tongue upward move the bolus backward right while pressing it against the hard palate and when it is has gone enough posteriorly right where especially in between the two tonsillar pillars there are tonsillar pillars on both sides they are the richest areas in sens sensory receptors for swallowing purpose right now as soon as you will stimulate this area what will happen that 
sensory system will take sensation to the yes central nervous system right from here which nerves will take information yes fifth and ninth is that right from interior to third this touch pin temperature from the fifth plus here also fifth nerve trigeminal sensory part is that right and ninth nerve loss of pharyngeal sensory part posterior part of the tongue so fifth nerve and ninth nerve they give what sensory input to the central nervous system to the swallowing reflex right swallowing reflex center let's suppose this is swallowing reflex center which is very near the respiratory center in medulla and swallowing reflex center is present in reticular formation and very near to the tectus solitarius nucleus right now this swallowing reflex in the brain stem and upper medulla and lower palms now as soon as food bolus reaches at this point sensory system is activated right about the presence of the food from here now what happens motor nerves will come out now motor component will come out through which they will come out through fifth you know fifth has a motor component also for muscles of mastication plus through ninth glossopharyngeus the motor component for stylopharyngeus and from tenth nerve you know tenth nerve has taking lot of fiber from nucleus and biguous you know that brachiomotor fibers right these fibers from the tenth they are also going to motor fiber from the vagus nerve they will also play a role in swallowing reflex now so sensations are coming out to fifth ninth tenth and if tongue is also moving then it is coming from which nerve tongue is moved by 12th these days right so there is sensory input central coordination and then motor output come now all these motor nerves right they are going to contract the muscles in this area in such a way that bolus will be transferred from here to the esophagus but what are the changes here number one the very first thing which we want is look what is this this is what is this hanging here yes soft palate right of course you will realize the part of soft palate right now first thing now if bolus come here let's suppose swallowing reflex is not working now mr bolus is here what are the choices for it it can go to the nose it can go to the respiratory system it can go to the system and unfortunately normally upper esophageal sphincter is closed or open yes normally upper esophageal sphincter is closed or open it is closed why normally upper esophageal sphincter is closed yeah pardon okay no i'm saying when you are not eating upper esophageal sphincter is closed significant tone why yes yes so that air does not enter in appropriately in gastrointestinal system is that right the air which comes out through anus is not coming through mouth that is produced somewhere distally is that right so actually upper esophageal sphincter is normally closed and lower esophageal sphincter is also normally closed in between the swallows why upper prevent the entry of the air here and lower prevent the reflux of from the stomach is that right now look at this if bolus moves here now what are the chances it can go to the nasal side is it appropriate way to get it there no so in pharyngeal state as soon as it will move backward now it is going into pharyngeal system at the pharyngeal stage of swallowing number one soft palate will move from down it will move upward why it has moved in that direction to prevent the movement of the bolus towards the nasal cavity or nasopharynx is that right secondly most important thing is that when the food bolus is moving we don't want any mistake the food bolus enter into a respiratory system is that right it can even kill the person if a big bolus does enter there so this should be prevented now how it is prevented 
how how do you prevent it yes number one these vocal cords swallowing reflex you know swallowing reflex the stimulate and vocal cords will be strongly approximated vocal cord will come together that is why you cannot swallow and talk simultaneously just imagine you are swallowing something and try to talk imagine you are swallowing something do you feel dumb or not try to talk while you just imagine that you are swallowing something simple imagination activate the swallowing mechanism in such a way vocal cord close and you cannot talk is that right so vocal cord will be approximated but there are further safeguards also what will happen this whole larynx will move upward and forward it will try to come under the tongue try to get away from the root of the food bolus you are understanding just hold your larynx and try to swallow your own saliva larynx moves or not where it goes it goes upward and anteriorly it is trying to come it is trying to move in number one upward number two interiorly so it is trying to trying to go under the tongue trying to hide it okay is that right and when it will go there what will happen to this lid this will close on that you are understanding what is epiglottis will close on that so what are the steps which have happened up to now that as soon as food bolus at the end once you feel that you have chewed enough and it is ready to be swallowed with the tongue you press the food bolus against the hard palate and then it slips backward and there it stimulates the swallowing reflex receptors epithelial especially on the tonsillar pillars and around the that entry of the oropharynx at that very point right fifth and ninth nerve take information to the central nervous system swallowing center is activated and that stimulates multiple motor nerves which are going to bring changes in all this area what are the changes soft palate lift upward block the way to the narrow what is this uh, nasopharynx vocal cords approximate larynx move upward and forward uh, what is this funny thing yes this will come over it epiglottis is that right will come over it and with that another thing will happen listen when larynx will move upward and interiorly what will open here upper esophageal sphincter upper esophageal sphincter remember one thing before i move to the esophagus i must tell you upper esophageal sphincter is the lower most part of inferior constrictor of the pharynx you know phary pharyngeal wall has three muscles the superior constrictor is that right then there is middle constrictor and then there is inferior constrictor an inferior constrictor has inferior most area which is connected with the cricoid bone you know under the larynx under the larynx here should be which bone cricoid bone so this lower most part of inferior what is this inferior pharyngeal muscle is cricopharyngeus muscle right this is acting also as upper esophageal sphincter when larynx move upward and interiorly upper esophageal sphincter become open now you see you have closed the way to the nose you have closed the way to the what is this to the airways another thing actually when you are pushing the food backward even the you know tonsillar pillars palato glossus muscles right they also approximate so that they approximate and when they muscles which are muscle arches down from here to the tongue here on one side and other side these muscles approximate and make a slit so that very big bolus should not go down sometimes you fail to swallow two big things is that true or not right so again let me repeat and put it in proper perspective as soon as swallowing reflex is stimulated soft palate move upward nasopharynx uh, closed uh, vocal cords approximated larynx move upward and forward and epiglottis covers over there right and now when larynx move forward and what happens upper esophageal sphincter open now food has only one way available 
almost at that very moment what happens that peristaltic wave is produced in pharyngeal muscles peristaltic wave right and that wave you know constrict above the food and relax below the bolus so what will happen peristalsis will sweep over all pharyngeal muscles from superior pharyngeal muscle first superior pharyngeal muscle will constrict push the bolus downward then middle pharyngeal muscle will constrict contract and then inferior pharyngeal muscle will contract and food bolus will enter into upper part of esophagus and we say which part is completed pharyngeal phase of swallowing is completed am i clear now after the pharyngeal phase has been complete remember it takes about one second one to uh, for this stage to push it from oral to pharyngeal side and in the pharyngeal side all this takes less than six seconds right usually two three seconds now once the food is an upper esophagus now esophageal stage of swallowing start in upper esophageal stage of swallowing will take the bullets from the upper part of esophagus up to the stomach it takes about eight to ten seconds and gravity help us and it may become fast is that right but remember that esophagus can swallow even in anti-gravity fashion if you decide to eat in a very specific position you first go upside down hang it down and then try to eat you can still eat it is that right so it means esophagus can take anti-gravity also food but it's better to take the help of gravity and eat in a proper position now what happens when food bolus enters into esophagus the law of gut will operate what is that that number one this food bolus will stretch that part of the esophagus is that right then what will happen peristalsis should be produced but remember primary peristalsis is not produced by this way primary peristalsis in esophagus is which initially takes the food bolus down that is simply a continuation of pharyngeal peristalsis let me repeat it as soon as bolus come into upper esophagus it does not produce a new peristalsis in the esophagus no actually the peristaltic movement which is sweeping over the pharynx which has taken the bolus up to esophagus same peristaltic constriction ring continues all over the esophagus but you can understand that my enteric plexus in the esophagus is helping with the whole system is that right that constriction ring is just yes what is happening that as bolus is moving forward right constriction ring is just proximal to the bolus right and relaxation receptive relaxation is distal to the bolus am i clear now as the food bolus is going down due to primary peristalsis which was original continuation of the peristalsis from pharyngeal action right it will take the food bolus up to the stomach but normally a uh, lower part of the esophagus here is slightly thickened and here smooth muscle here the smooth muscle has a higher tone it has normally high tone and it remain closed and so if food bolus has to pass through this area which is called lower esophageal sphincter right if food bolus has to pass through this area then this must be relaxed but you know the mechanism as food bolus is approaching the descending connections of myenteric plexus will produce inhibitory what neurotransmitters here vip and nitric oxide so actually just above the bolus acetylcholine and substance p is being produced and below the bolus what is being produced vip and nitric oxide and this will keep on pushing the bolus downward so naturally when bolus is coming down lower esophageal sphincter will relax this is very important point that approaching peristalsis relax the lower esophageal sphincter not only lower esophageal sphincter but also the upper part of stomach this is called receptive relaxation that these part of gastrointestinal system are getting re relaxed to receive the food what we call it receptive relaxation so when food bolus is coming near lower esophageal sphincter automatically relax 
एज स्टिमुलेशन टू द माइंटेरिक प्लेक्सेस जनरेट लॉट ऑफ इनहिबिटरी न्यूरो ट्रांसमीटर वी आई पी एंड नाइट्रिक ऑक्साइड हियर एंड वेन इट रिलैक्सेज फूड बोलस विल कम टू द स्टमक एम आई क्लियर ना वाई एम स्ट्रेसिंग सो मच हियर नाउ इट इज नॉट हैप्पी बिकॉज दिस एसिड पुल देयर आई एम स्ट्रेसिंग सो मच दैट इन सम डिजीजेज इन सम कंडीशन लोअर एसो फेजल स्पिंटर फेल टू रिलैक्स and if fail to relax food will keep on accumulating in esophagus and it will not enter into stomach properly in time do you know what is this like this this condition is called achalasia have you heard of achalasia right what is achalasia achalasia is basically a problem in which clinical condition in which lower esophageal sphincter fail to relax on anticipatory arrival of peristalsis normally it should is that right we will discuss about achalasia later but of course you can understand now why achalasia should be there what why the achalasia should be there very simple very simple tell me because myenteric plexus is not working here because the duty of the mind direct plexus is that as bolus is moving forward it should produce a receptive relaxation in the distal segments of the gastrointestinal system so in some diseases some conditions ganglia and myenteric ganglia are not present here when myenteric ganglia are not present here congenitally then this achalasia will be present or difficulty in swallowing will be present from very beginning difficulty in swallowing is called dysphagia right now in achalasia dysphagia occur difficulty in swallowing occur it may be in early part of the life or it may be secondarily there is a condition there is a parasite called trypanosoma cruzi trypanosoma cruzi cruzes down here and i don't know why it loves to destroy the ganglion or myenteric plexus especially in this area trypanosoma cruzi and when it destroy the ganglion here you can understand what will happen what will happen food will come down up to this but because it failed to show any relaxation right because vip is not there nitric oxide is not there so what will happen food will accumulate in esophagus but here i want to tell you one thing more in normal esophageal stage of swallowing usually primary peristalsis start from pharyngeal side and continue down there but sometimes you have eaten some kind of food that some of it may be sticking here and there let's suppose all the bolus has gone down but one piece of the bolus is sticking here and refuse to go down what will happen then and other peristalsis will produced only in this area and sweep down and it will keep on sweeping until this monkey goes down the sticking food you are understanding those peristalsis are called secondary peristalsis so normally esophagus has which type of peristalsis primary peristalsis which is the continuation of pharyngeal peristalsis but if some food is retained within the lumen of esophagus wherever it is retained secondary peristalsis are generated there by distension and stretch right and they will keep on working downward until the retained food is thrown into stomach but if achalasia of cardia is there then what will happen if achalasia is there in achalasia esophagus will become like this it will become dilated at the top because you are bringing the food there but here lower esophageal sphincter ref ref refuse to open is that right and in this case what will happen if food is too much accumulated here it will get infected because normally when food goes down into stomach if there are bacteria there and of course food has lot of bacteria so they will be killed by the hcl but if food is retained for longer time into esophagus does not have any effective mechanism to kill the bacteria food gets infected and putrefied so person will have very bad smell but this is really not most dangerous thing the most dangerous thing is when this person will sleep maybe this food enter into respiratory system because when this person will sleep uh, these reflexes will become inhib slightly inhibited and there's a chance a little piece of food goes down and disturb or infection start in respiratory system right and this person cannot eat well of course he will be wasted so achalasia is a condition in which lower esophageal sphincter fail to relax 
on arrival of the peristalsis in esophagus and food a larger amount of food collect into esophagus even though this is not a mucosal disease but when food remain here and become portrayed and infected it damages the mucosa also and mucosa of esophagus also become what ulcerated right that produces substance pain also and person says i cannot swallow well right so anyway once uh, so these are few words about your esophageal reflex do you have any question there's no question up to this right now we'll see that we have done this uh, voluntary stage which initiates the swallowing is one second pharyngeal stage will take three four five seconds but interrupts the respiratory system only for a very brief time and esophageal st stage takes how much time esophageal stage eight to ten second is that right but gravity assist right and then never forget when esophageal peristalsis is coming down receptive relaxation is not only in the esophageal sphincter but it is also in upper part of stomach stomach gets ready to receive the okay now we come to the okay he wants me to have a break